Good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, I was born in the UK, and based on the results of the elections, I may be considering moving back to the UK. <laughs> got a couple of weeks before the inauguration, so got time to make that decision. Um, and I bring you greetings from the American Academy of Audiology, where I serve as president. And in that role, part of what I do is have to look across the broad landscape of hearing care and look at what's happening, what's the future, and where do we need to go uh, in, across all those different areas. And so some of the things I'm going to speak about this morning uh, will tie in nicely to Kevin Monroe's talk, to Adrian Davis's talk, and to the prior speakers and what they had to say. One of the things that um, we think a lot about in the U.S. and um, in the framework here is what's happening in the U.S. Uh, so it may, some of these things will apply here, some may not, uh, because they're generally related to hearing care and the global issues associated with hearing care. But one of the things that's happening are disruptions. The election was a disruption to many of us. Um, but what are those disruptions that are happening in hearing care? They're going to change the way we deliver that care, or at least how we think about that care being delivered. And this concept of innovation and disruption and disruptive innovation came about in the late 1990s uh, by a gentleman named Clayton, Clayton Christensen. And he talked about products or technologies or models or stem cells or whatever it might be, these new things, concepts that come along and change the existing market and change the way we think. And this is the um, simplistic view of that uh, concept of disruptive innovation. And that is that a product, let's take a, uh, the hearing aids that we're using today that that product, as seen with the blue line, continues to, to change and evolve. There's sustained innovation. It becomes, um, we, did, uh, we heard about compression or, or connectivity or whatever it might be that those products continue to do better and better. Music programming, et cetera. And that innovation continues to be sustained, even while the marketplace says, it may be more than we need, and that's the green line. So the marketplace, and in this case, part of the marketplace is us, because we use those products and deliver them, wonders if the products that are being developed don't overshoot what we actually need. So Grant indicated that a linear program for music may be better than wide dynamic range. So that's more innovation than perhaps is necessary to meet the needs of us or the patient. And because that gap grows, this disconnect between the two grows as well. And the satisfaction changes, the value proposition changes as well. So to, so to meet that need, something new over time also is developed and enters the market at the low end. By low end, it's typically simplistic, lower quality, lower value. But it begins to expand over time and soon gets closer to what the needs of the public are, the consumer, the audiologist. And as that happens, if the incumbents, those that are currently producing uh, products, do not respond, the disruption occurs to these groups and they get uh, put out of business, as Clayton Christensen would say, they begin to fail. So the changes, this could be a new product. It could be an over-the-counter device, as was referenced earlier. It could be a new way of delivering hearing care via the internet. Any number of things that can disrupt the delivery of care. And that becomes the focus uh, for disruption in audiologic care as well. The three important elements to consider are that whatever the disruption is will simplify. It will generally come in at a lower cost, cost being 
to a health service, to uh, a consumer, et cetera, and the value proposition, that cost to benefit ratio is somehow sufficient enough that, that the consumer will um, buy into that, that service or model or delivery. And it's all mitigated or, or facilitated by regulations and standards. So as we look across the landscape in the U.S. of the potential disruptions that are going to affect our practice, we can put them into these five categories. And I'm not going to uh, speak to the economics simply because I know our systems are different and we don't even know what our system is going to be in a few years, so there's no sense in talking about it. Um, but I want to just kind of touch again broadly on some of these potential disruptions that are going to occur, uh, and they're all tied together uh, in one way, but they're occurring in our market now. And the first one of these, of course, is in the technological area and the development of these uh, P, personal sound amplification products or PSAPs and these that are available to the consumer in a kind of an over-the-counter basis. In the U.S. these products cannot be sold for hearing loss. They can be sold for uh, to improve your discrimination and background noise. They can be sold for uh, enhancing your hearing. But they cannot be marketed for hearing loss. The government has regulations in place that say you can do it anything except for hearing loss. If it's for hearing loss, it becomes a hearing aid. So as long as they're in this domain, they're okay. But those rules, as I'll show you in a minute, may be changing. And so these products, though, are proliferating and are available in many, many places now uh, moving forward. Similarly, we see a disruption or a potential disruption in branding. The idea of what the consumer knows and understands about the hearing healthcare business. I often ask, when I'm with a group of audiologists, how many of their new patients would understand or know what, is, what Phonak or Oticon or Starkey, have they ever heard of those products? And the answer is generally no, a new patient would never know that. But in a company like Samsung, they do know, they will have known. And so when you have a brand change within the marketplace, and whether Samsung comes in as a hearing aid or more of this PSAP type device, that will disrupt our market as well. And having talked to some of these companies directly, we know that this is coming and it will change the dynamics in the delivery of healthcare. Similarly, the market for hearables. This is a report that was generated and came out last week by Y4 Consulting which looks at the hearable marketplace. And you note that hearing aids are part of that marketplace, but you also note all the other areas in which hearables are expanding. And, and the, uh, the question is, is how will hearing aids fit into a marketplace in which um, biometric information is, in, is um, an available, in which uh, the uh, manipulation of external sounds is possible to enhance hearing. How does the individual with hearing loss take advantage of all these other factors that enhance hearing? And we see a great growth in this marketplace and the investments in the marketplace over the next 10 years. And so how do these groups fit together? And some of you may know of the, the Italian company Bragi, uh, which developed the Dash. And, and we see this kind of convergence of technologies um, when a group like Starkey announces that they are joined forces to kind of merge these types of technologies together. And a Frank Brent Edwards at the American Auditory Society a couple of years ago uh, who worked for uh, in the Starkey research area uh, talked about the idea of the merger of these these technologies that will either embrace the professional or eliminate them from the distribution channel moving forward. And I think that was kind of referenced this morning about what people can do on their own at home. Uh, uh, so that all call, that leads into kind of how do we deliver that care then moving forward. The technology is changing. It may be more accessible to individuals on an over-the-counter or a direct-to-consumer basis. What about the delivery systems and how they're changing? 
And one of the one of the factors, the key factors, is the concept of self-directed care. And that's an emerging perspective of the consumer in the U.S. for sure, and perhaps in other areas, but how does the consumer take care of their own problems? When somebody has an injury, they, uh, you're playing football and, and sprain your ankle, you self-direct your care initially, typically. You may take an anti-inflammatory or a pain reliever or put ice or heat, et cetera, on it. So you're directing your own care. You are actually in charge of the assessment, the diagnosis, and the treatment of care uh, of that situation. That does not exist in hearing care to a great degree. There's no opportunity for the consumer to self-direct their care. And that becomes an important concept to the consumer that they do not want to engage the healthcare professional. They do not want to engage the audiologic channel in that regard. And in fact, the Hearing Loss Association of America, a leading consumer group, uh, published this policy statement that includes the concepts that they want access to all types of technology and they want it any way they can get it. So whether it's through online uh, access, uh, uh, pharmacy companies, or even retail. But not, it doesn't mention, um, or it does mention the hearing healthcare specialist, but it also wants all these access points within healthcare. And that, that um, you know, speaks to a group primarily that Dr. Taylor, Brian Taylor, talks about the individuals who um, uh, actually use amplification and that 90% of those in this mild to moderate care category do not use amplification. In the US, our market penetration rate is half of what you have in the UK. So we see even less people using amplification devices. And that's a big group of individuals. But those individuals are very interested in what he terms a transactional relationship to acquiring hearing care. That is, they want to be able to walk into a store, buy a product off the shelf, and walk out. And that's the interest. These people do not want to engage the healthcare system to a great degree, but they would engage it on a transactional basis where they simply can um, uh, buy a product and walk out, kind of an over-the-counter product. And we're beginning to see that evolve now. One of our leading pharmacy chains that has 10,000 locations across the U.S is now beginning to expand into the hearing care area and with both hearing aids and these other types of devices that are available in what we're kind of calling the corporatization of audiology. Similarly, the telehealth options that, that you all know uh, much about are expanding. And a lot of telehealth options focus on assessment. There's a great expansion in the area of services in which the patients don't enter the office, but follow-up services and counseling can be done. A little screenshot of what we're doing at our hospital um, in terms of following up with children identified with hearing loss. And the advisory board recently showed that if you, um, you know, in a survey of patients, uh, are you ready for virtual uh, care, the percentage of respondents who would do post-op appointments or ongoing care for a chronic condition was three out of four. So we're seeing a, a large consumer expansion in that area to embrace, um, again, not entering that healthcare system, but sitting on the outside and do it in a simple way, saves them time, energy, and, and certainly money. In the area of innovation, some of the things that our, our, the panelists this morning have already been uh, discussing is this shift in treatment to, to pharmaceuticals both whether it's a direct uh, drug, stem cell treatments, regeneration of hair cells, et cetera. We're seeing a big shift. And so we have begun the conversation in the U.S. about the role of audiologists in treatment using these types of, of um, uh, new developments. In the U.S., we do not, as audiologists, dispense, uh, have dispensing uh, rights or prescription rights. But we are discussing now whether that's part of our scope of, the scope of practice in the future that we should begin moving down that direction because we see this growing uh, number of, of startup companies that are looking at, at these issues and problems moving forward. So that's really 
expanding so rapidly and although we appreciate hearing that this may be 20 years down the road, we have to have that conversation now because it takes us that long to be able to evolve to that level in our educational systems, in our clinical practices, in our legal systems, et cetera. So we're beginning to do that. And similarly, we're also expanding our, our perspective about imaging and what the role of the audiologist is in, in ordering and using imaging studies, uh, particularly of brain function, the expansion of our innovation and understanding of brain function and how it contributes to hearing and the role of functional imaging, which is right up our alley, is really important to us. So we begin to this discussion of how does that fit into our future. And finally, on the regulatory issue, um, we have a big concern in the states because most hearing aids are an out-of-pocket expense. They cost about $5,000, which if my math is correct, is about 3,500 um, pounds uh, for a set of devices, and that's a very significant uh, outlay for individuals. That cost is, being, is driving uh, the discussion. So our President's Council of Advisors, or we, we call PCAST, issued a report last year at this time um, on technology and aging, and one chapter was on hearing loss. And they indicated that there should be a, a category of hearing aids that are sold over the counter, and that our Food and Drug Administration, which regulates these devices, should withdraw their guidance and allow PSAPs for hearing loss. And that's a big issue in our country. It's really been a significant, um, uh, caught, a, caught a lot of us off guard and got a lot of our attentions. And then our Food and Drug Administration went on and reopened their discussion and are currently waiting, we are waiting to hear what they have to say about these types of devices. Uh, Adrian Davis this morning referenced this study, the Hearing Healthcare for Adults study. It's online and it's available. And they also um, recommend a new category of over-the-counter counter devices for uh, the consumer to access. This is, again, you know, caught a lot of us off guard, even though audiologists were on this panel that developed this study and the results. But these are recommendations only. There are, there's no weight in the, in the government. There's no weight in any other kind of, of areas, except that on Monday of this week, new legislation was introduced in our Congress um, that uh, would mandate that these devices be available over the counter. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, this was, we don't know where this has come from, but it's hit this week, and so we're um, very interested on many levels as to why this is happening. But nonetheless, it speaks to the driving forces that are causing us to think differently, that it's not just about hearing aids, it's not just about PSAPs, but it's also about access of patients, and we don't have that much um, time and, and energy. So there's a difference between disruptive innovation and being disruptive, correct? And, and the legislation uh, is probably disruptive, but our election is really disruptive. And every time a new president takes over, there's a change in priorities. And we feel like that some of those changes, uh, these things may not occur with this, with our new guy. I don't know what to call him, so I'm just baffled with the whole thing. So anyway, we're not sure what's going to happen moving forward with the legislation is the point. But we do think that our practice of the future is going to be influenced by many of these factors um, and, and changes. Our Affordable Care Act, or what's called Obamacare, is likely to be changed dramatically given our changes in these past elections. But we do kind of have this vision, a sense, a growing understanding of where we're going to be in 20 years. And so our, our kind of goal today or our thinking is that we would like to become the primary care providers for uh, hearing loss, the general practitioners for the ear above and beyond anyone else. That, but that's going to require us to look across systems. We're going to have to think about hearing health, not just hearing loss. We're going to have to think about our scope of practice, the use of pharmaceuticals, brain function, brain imaging, and certainly the changes in technology, they're going to influence what we do moving forward. 
So with that, I thank you. I appreciate your attention. Um, I'll be around for the next two days and look forward to, to meeting many of you. Thank you very much.